Mr. Ward, scene is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction, and uh, we'll follow Hershey Sun's amazing, contemplative, and profound talk with um, something a little more mundane and painful, <laughs> which is software um, to do daylight simulation. <clears throat> so what is daylight simulation? Well, it is essentially predicting the performance of some candidate building design um, under a particular set of conditions. Uh, the input is a building model, of course, with materials and suitable detail. And the output is a set of images and or performance metrics that help you to evaluate that, that design. <clears throat> the software itself implements a set of useful approximations to mimic the uh, aspects of the problem that we care about. And that's important because we can't exactly solve the problem. And we also don't want to consider things that don't matter and take, you know, the right shortcuts. Um, so here we have an example simulation of uh, San Francisco air traffic control tower from 20 years ago, I think. It's been replaced since then. But they were very concerned with whether they'd be able to read these displays under full daylight conditions because, of course, they can't draw curtains um, and the displays only have a certain brightness. These were back in the days of CRTs. So they were evaluating different shading systems and, and geometric arrangements and possibly different displays. And they needed detailed information about all the materials and, and the, the daylight entering the space. And um, obviously, what comes at your eye is not illuminance. You don't, they don't really care what the levels are on, the, on the, the horizontal surfaces. They care about what comes to the eye and whether they can see things. Um, so radiance is a calculation that can numerically figure this out. So it not just, it's not just giving you a picture, it's giving you an evaluation of, of the actual light that will, that will reach your eye. And with that, you can do all sorts of things. So the requirements for this type of simulation includes the, the geometry, as mentioned. Typically, this comes from CAD software. And then you have to have materials, textures, and patterns that you've scanned or measured or estimated somehow. Um, and then you need to know the daylight conditions and the electric lighting controls and so forth, as well as the analysis points, the metrics you want to use, views, animation paths, and so on. So it's a lot of information to feed in to, to get things out. And, and um, each step of the way, you have to make sure that what you're doing is, is correct. And you have this trade-off between calculation time and uh, accuracy that you have to play with. So it takes a lot of you know, building up to to this, the expertise needed to, to run this software. So what is Radiance exactly? It's a collection of about 150 command line tools. Um, how many of you know what a command line is, even at this point? So about a third, fourth of you. Yeah, most people are used to menus and things, and, and we don't provide those. So <laughs> for example, one tool might import the CAD model, then another will We'll compile it together with a set of luminaires that were converted by a third tool and placed by a fourth tool. And then a fifth tool will render an HDR picture that a sixth tool will convert to a false color image. And a seventh tool will put up on the display. So that's, that's a lucky number of tools right there. So standard file formats are an important part of the design of this kind of a toolkit system. It's called a Unix um, sort of pipeline model. So you have to have standard file formats to communicate between the tools with. And there are 16 or more standard for formats within Radiance, each of which has an information header. So very early on in the development of the software, back in the mid-'80s, I, I would have these files that I named poorly, and I would not remember how I created the files. So having a, an information header that, that included the names of the commands and actually the options for the commands that generated the files was very handy. And so I just decided, well, at the front of every file, well, there will be this collection of metadata that says what generated it, maybe what, what version of the software was running, other information that other programs could use, and include the format. I mean, this is actually added a little later, but that specifies what the rest of the file, which is binary and you can't read, contains. So there are a whole bunch of tool categories, and I roughly just threw these together based on the 
list of 150 commands, because I didn't think anyone wanted to look at those. I don't even want to look at those. Um, but in this slide, I've, I've called out a couple of these acronyms. HDR stands for High Dynamic Range, and this is something that was introduced with Radiance um, back in its first version, uh, and has since become important in lots of different areas. You've probably heard of HDR photography, but maybe you don't really know what it is because you think it's the button on your iPhone, but it's not. Um, it's starting to show up in television sets, for example. And then BSDF is another thing that's been thrown around a lot. It stands for bidirectional scattering distribution function. So it, it's how light interacts with surfaces, it's sort of like the full description of that. So you can see there's several categories of tools, and each category has quite a you know, dozen or so tools in them. So it's a lot of stuff developed over a lot of years and with input from a lot of people. So why not just combine all the tools into one general tool? Well, you can think of the, the comparison of a DSLR camera versus a, a phone. You, you want to have that flexibility to change lenses and, and flashes and whatever in, des in running the software. Um, however, there are, there are still a few executive tools in Radiance that will do sort of basic stuff for you. Like if you just want to do a rendering, there's a tool that can help you do that. Um, but there's only so much you can do with a, with a combined tool. So programmability is really key to using, applying this to hard problems. So who uses Radiance and what is it good for? Um, Radiance is used by a lot of A&E firms to predict performance of novel designs and daylighting systems, and users of Radiance in the raw, sort of the command line interface, tend to be fairly advanced. Um, a lot of other people use it through third-party interfaces that are specialized for particular tasks, and they might not even know they're using it. Um, but Radiance itself really excels at handling the difficult problems. This is an example taken from Zach Rogers' presentation. Um, was it this year or last year? I think it might even be this year. Um, where he was, he was trying to design this atrium, not trying to design, did design this atrium for the Vancouver, new Vancouver a Airport wing, where they had an interior um, plants, and then they were trying to avoid overwhelming the people who were in the neighboring seating areas, and so he was playing with different frit patterns and trying to optimize that. This is an example of the kind of problem that you can, you can have at least an approach to with, with Radiance. And from the previous year, um, Xientan, and Zentan and some others worked on this um, sort of like par parametric model where they were using um, prismatic films on the glazings and trying to optimize the shape of the buildings and where they put the films and so on. So they, they used uh, radiance with ladybug and grasshopper to parameterize this problem and optimize the solution and included BSDFs of the materials and, and, and things like that. Um, and then we ourselves, about 20 years ago, worked on the New York Times building design by Renzo Piano Architects, and we're anal analyzing different shades um, for the, to protect the interior from, to, from excessive glare. So we modeled, or, or actually imported, a model of the surrounding Manhattan um, buildings and modeled a few, f well, it's just one floor and then has an ab above and a below facade to handle the interreflections between between levels, but really you only need to model one floor and you can move it up and down in the building. Um, and then going inside, you can see how light enters this space, and you have these cylindrical elements on the exterior facade that are redirecting daylight supposedly deeper into the space, but actually also causing a bit of, of glare, which we want to control with these blinds that you could drop from the ceiling and automate, and we're, so, we're studying how to automate these, and this is work done with. Um, John Mardelevic did most of the analysis on this, Eleanor Lee did a lot of the other work, <laughs> and they looked at about 140 gigabytes of data over an annual simulation with diff you know, sky models to, to figure out where are they going to put the shades, how are they going to control them, and so forth. So they had to consider glare, as well as light levels, as well as what the interior electrical system, electrical lighting was doing, and so on. And then I just have a few examples that were taken from a particular A&E firm, Loisos Ubo Load, which is um, in our area in Alameda in California, um, just to show how one 
particular firm uses radiance in, in different designs. So this is a temple from Palo Alto that they were working on and helped design. This is a warehouse renovation where they were looking at um, these sawtooth skylights and figuring out what the light levels on the walls were. Um, this is, uh, they have actually a couple of these, but this is Valley Children's Hospital Outpatient Center um, in Central California. And the, the, the diagram outside, this is a lot of their own software in addition to Radiance, so the programmability again enters into this, um, where they put the sun path diagram on the exterior of the window to show where the sun would be at different times of year and how this would cause um, issues with visibility from the perspective of the receptionist. Um, but you can't really tell with a standard image that that's too bright. So in Radiance, we also have ways to simulate what happens in your eye when you're presented with the sun in your vision and how it scatters and causes a, a intense sort of glare. And this is a simulation of, of that designed to evoke a similar kind of feeling of glare, if not an exact representation. Um, and they could use this to convince the clients that they need, they need some sort of shading controls on that, on that window, at least for certain times of the year. Um, this is another uh, design they looked at more recently. Um, this is a, a private residence in Southern California, a very fancy residence where all the, all the shapes and all the walls and are curved. Um, you might say, well, that's very nice, but why do you need to do daylight analysis in this case? Well, they did for two reasons. One, to, to look at the light levels on the artwork, because they were going to have a lot of expensive art on the wall. And another, they had these concave windows that at certain times of year could cause intense focusing of light on the uh, patio, and, and even to the point of being a fire hazard. So they analyzed that, and this is just showing false color plan view, how um, on the patio there they have a, a very high intensity. I don't know what it is exactly. It looks like 12,000 lux or foot candles. I don't know what their unit is. is it foot candles? Luminous. Lux, OK. Still high. Still high. Um, so I thought about, a lot about this. Um, I didn't start with the ambition of being the premier daylighting simulation. This is sort of how we ended up. Um, does seem to be the case at this point. Uh, and so I considered, you know, how did we get here? I think a, a big part of it is that we started development a long time ago, 30 years ago. And we made evolutionary changes over time. So rather than rewriting it multiple times or starting with something new, we basically just kept adding to it. Um, it's been heavily validated against real-world measurements. So a number of people have done very careful validations of radiance calculations against the real world. So it's known to be reliable, and we've tried to keep it that way. Um, the fact that it's open source, you can see the source code, you can change the source code, you can make it your own and add to it. Um, really invites contributions from the daylighting researchers, such as yourself and, and your colleagues. And that benefits as well. It was designed primarily as a calculation engine others could use. So we didn't go for any particular market. We just wanted to have the ability to do these sorts of, sorts of calculations. And there's not much incentive to develop your own tool when you can just adopt and improve what's available and, and free. So. So that's pretty much how we got here. Problems that Radiance solves in particular are, is determining how much light arrives at a point from which, and which, from which direction. In fact, Radiance is the actual radiometric unit for that quantity. And this is historically known as the global illumination problem. How does light bounce around in a space? Um, obviously, part of that is how does light interact with the surfaces, the material properties, and the BSDF is an important part of this and something we've continued to work on. And then there's the surrounding input and output pro problems. Most of those tools in that list of 150 tools or in various categories um, involve converting inputs and outputs and manipulating data in ways that you need to do to, to, to solve your, your the actual problem at hand. Human perception is part of that. Problems Radiance doesn't solve, there are quite a few. Creating the ge geometric model of, of the building is obviously a very important problem, but can have 
pretty, pretty well addresses that problem. And we do import from standard formats, such as Wavefront. It'd be nice if we imported from Revit at this point. We don't have a, a standard for, for that. Um, doesn't handle managing material problem properties. You have to do that yourself somehow. But we do provide ways to interpolate and measure BSDF data, for example. And then we also don't, at this point anyway, connect to glazing and luminaire bases, uh, databases, which would be a nice thing to have, but we don't have it. Um, and then it also doesn't automate, at this point, standard analyses such as spatial daylight autonomy, which is relatively new, and certainly people use radiance for it, but we don't have a standard process for, for getting there. Um, we also don't link, at this point, to whole building simulations which, is, again, is something other tools can do and would be nice to have in Radiance, but there are these other tools. So, DaySim, Diva for Rhino, ISVE, some of these tools link to, to, to whole building energy simulations. Um, many of them will do things like SDA, light stanzas, an online tool that you don't even have to install on your system. You just go to, the, to their website and start entering data. Groundhog is a, is a nice little tool that's, that um, someone put together that, that does integrated sort of calculations. And then there's Ladybug and Honeybee. How many have heard of Ladybug and Honeybee? Hopefully, yeah. It's, it's very, it's like grasshoppers, but more tuned to, to this kind of simulation, energy simulation. And there are probably half a dozen other tools that use Radiance as well. Um, ongoing research and development. We're doing further refinements to data-driven BSDFs, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, glare analysis for um, where the solar orb is in the field of view is, is an ongoing problem that we're looking at. Air analysis for annual simulations matrix methods. So we have these three-phase methods and four-phase and five-phase. I think Andy is here somewhere, and he added at least three or four phases to this whole thing. Um, and uh, an executive program for running these, these simulations is something that, that we're working on currently, as well as integrating Radiance in simulations into Spawn. So quickly, to, to give an example of BSDF models that we've worked on, most simulations rely on a mathematical models. So there's the S. Schickman, whoops, we went, can we go backwards? Oh, there's the Schickman Shirley model shown there, which you know, it looks kind of nasty, but it's actually not that complicated as BSDF models goes, and does a good job of, of modeling a lot of materials. But if you have a set of measurements like we have here, um, this is from a, a brushed aluminum. This is what the Schickman Shirley model looks like in red, trying to match these points. Sort of did a least squares match to those data points, and you can see it doesn't get the retro reflection, it doesn't really match the peak. Um, we can do much better if we use a data-driven model, which is what we've developed as, as part of Radiance, and that's shown in green here. So we can get close to pretty much any shape that you put in, because it's not based on anything other than the data that you're giving it. Um, also for transmitting materials, which are more of interest to daylight, this is a prismatic film. This is an actual photograph of a prismatic film in front of a checkerboard. And then we can apply a, a, a fitted uh, mathematic model fit for transmission from Walter, Walter et al. And you see that it's not a very good representation, whereas the data-driven BSDF shown here, this is a rendering, both the previous and this are renderings, is much closer to the original. And if you look at the, the BSDF data points, this is for transmission at, at a steep angle. Um, there's the Walter et al. fit, and this is this is the data-driven um, BTDF. And the effect on rendering is quite profound. Here's the model um, from Walter et al., and this is the um, data-driven representation, and you can see that like, it gets much further back into the space, which is the design of a prismatic system in the first place. And this is <laughs> even more visible on the, on the lux levels and the surfaces. Um, the Walter et al. model is a very poor approximation of the real thing. So what does the future hold for radiance? Um, currently, we're working on new regression tests where um, the software will, when it gets built, test itself to make sure that everything's working properly. 
we need to add more of those. Um, LBL continues to have a stake, as do EPFL and other institutions, and funding's been pretty steady over the past few years. And then eventually, developers of other tools that are using Radiance or based on it may take over code ma maintenance if LBL falls behind. But I want to end with uh, a note about collaboration and community, which are really the keys to, to Radiance's success over the years. So it's been around for three decades, and a lot of people have, have taken it on. Um, and most of the ideas that went into its development did not come from me by myself. They were actually good ideas provided to me or helped along by others or even written by others. And a spirit of collaboration is really essential to any set of tools that, that hundreds of people use, but no one is a is complete master of. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much.